I didn't think that what was happening was good. But I thought it was normal. I thought of it a little bit like food. People have different tastes in food, the way some people have different tastes in sexuality. In 2017, a German man named Marco was perusing a German newspaper and stumbled upon an article with a picture of a professor he knew as a child. The article described an investigation into what was called the Kentler Experiment. This experiment was authorized by the Berlin Senate and financially backed. It was described as a complete success. You see, Marco had grown up in foster care and his foster father often took him to Kentler's home. Marco is a grown man now, and his one-year-old daughter takes up the majority of his day. Upon reading this article, he simply pushed it aside and went about his usual day. Marco is a well-developed individual, physically and emotionally. Nothing really gets to him, or emotionally upsets him. He never discussed his life with his girlfriend, which whom he lived with. He attempted to work as a mailman, but quit a few days in because whenever strangers gave off a similar expression to that of his foster father, Fritz Hunkel, he would go into a panic attack. He couldn't speak nor feel his own heart beating. Professor Kentler was particularly interested in Marco's upbringing, and Marco wasn't sure why. He often heard his foster father frequently speaking with Kentler about him. Marco had lived with his foster father until he was 21. He told Sven, one of his foster brothers, that they had been part of an experiment. Sven wasn't able to process this. He wanted to block out all the memories of what had happened. After the divorce of Marco's parents and further signs of neglect, such as leaving Marco and his brother at the daycare for extended periods of time, repeatedly sending them off in dirty clothes, caseworkers recommended that the boys be placed in foster care. One caseworker described Marco as an attractive and easily influenced boy. Marco was assigned to live with Fritz Hankel, a 47-year-old single man. Marco was his eighth foster son in 16 years. Hankel had many strange signs about him. Teachers quickly noticed he only wanted to be in contact with boys, and a caseworker eventually found out that Hankel had been in a homosexual relationship with one of his foster children. Professor Kentler often found himself coming to the defense of Hankel, giving Kentler's scientific knowledge and status in the country. Hankel always got off of the allegations. Kentler was described as the nation's chief authority on questions of sexual education at the time. Criminal investigations were quickly suspended given this defense. Marco shared an apartment with Hankel and two other foster sons, one aged 16 and another 24. Sven moved in a year and a half later. Sven was a runaway. He was from another country, Romania. Sven was found in a Berlin subway station sick with hepatitis. He was seven years old and begging for money. Hunkel, given his pristine record with fostering young boys, caseworkers believed he was the right man for the job. Sven was a good boy. Marco was more defiant. Except in the night. Before Sven joined the foster family, Marco had been dealing with a deep and dark secret, one that he kept to himself. Marco was most definitely defiant when it came to parental rules, but at night time as he slept in his bed, where he was most vulnerable, he gave in to things that he thought were normal but never thought were right. Fritz Hankel would almost every night sneak into Marco's room and cuddle with him. And he would fondle him and pretty much do whatever he felt like with Marco. The boys never discussed what had happened with them the entire time they were living under that roof. Marco was so distraught by this one night he grabbed a knife and hid it under his pillow. In the night, Hankel would often creep into Marco's room as he slept. This night, Marco had dozed off waiting for Hankel to emerge. The knife at this point had slipped from under his pillow and was completely visible to Hankel. 
He snatched a knife from Marco's open palm and called Professor Kentler. He made Marco answer for what he was committing. Marco simply said there was a devil behind the wall. Kentler, in a grandfatherly voice, explained away to Marco that there is no such thing as devils, and Marco went back to bed. Marco's mother and brother were only allowed to visit him once a month, Hanko often canceling the visits at the last minute, saying they were being disruptive that this caused Marco to wet the bed and he seemed to develop some sort of dyslexia in school any time he would spend time with his mother. Hanko told Kentler and Kentler agreed that the visits from his mother were harming his progression in school. Hanko and Kentler often drummed up stories of Marco's father beating him and coaching Marco to go along with these allegations, even though the two men had never actually met Marco's father. Marco's teachers recommended that Marco see a child therapist. The therapist was quickly seen as an adversary by the two men because he came to the conclusion that Franz Hankel was actually holding Marco prisoner. Hankel always sat in a room very close by to the session room. One such incident involved Hankel storming into the room after a session began without his knowledge. This caused him to strike the therapist in the face. Naturally, after all this, Kentler advised that he would be the one to carry out any future psychological tests on any of the boys in Hankel's care. He describes Hankel as someone who needs trust and protection, as he is someone who deals with broken children, so his methods of fostering them aren't that simple. Marco's mother tried to petition for more visiting rights with her son, and this backfired, as Hankel and Kentler convinced Marco to tell the judge that having his mom around would be a bad idea. And then the judge ruled that Marco was not to have contact with his mother for at least two years. Hamut Kendler believed, and his entire career is framed in the belief that there is damage created by dominant fathers. Kentler often wanted more physical affection and recognition from his own father. He often has a faint memory of going through the forest with his father as his father tries to lead him on a hunting trip and all he wanted his father to do was hold his hand through this ordeal. His father didn't believe in showing such signs of affection. You see, his father was a World War I lieutenant. Die letzte Kompanie kennt nicht Litz und nicht Schnur. Die letzte Kompanie kennt das eine nur. Gebt den Glauben uns zurück, den ihr gestern uns geraubt. Die letzte Kompanie marschiert. Kentler's parents closely followed the teachings of a Daniel Gottlob Moritz Schreiber, who believed in principles of making stronger young men through ridding them of cowardice, laziness, and unwanted displays of vulnerability and desire to create the perfect race. Emotions must be suffocated in their seed right away. Anytime Kentler talked out of turn, his father would slam his fist on the table and shout, When the father talks, the children must be silent. Kentler was 10 during Kristallnacht in 1938. This is when Nazis began raiding Jewish temples, businesses, and homes, rounding up Jewish people. When a neighboring Jewish family arrived at the family's door begging to spend the night, Kentler's father simply said, No, that will not be possible here. This caused Kentler to view his father in a poor light. His father soon returned to duty. Du, meine Arbeit für Richtigkeit, ob du glaubst, dass ich fleißig gewesen bin, when the Nazis eventually lost, Kentler was 17 when his father returned. He observed him as a broken man and never obeyed him again. Homosexuality was heavy policed in the years after the war. Kentler was attracted to men and felt if he was already in prison himself. Kentler goes on to become a psychologist. Given how he grew up, he supported the ideas of one Wilhelm Reich, who argued that free flow of sexual energy was essential to build a new society. Kentler urged parents to never let their children be ashamed of their desires. This was very personal to Kentler, as you could argue that he developed his attraction toward men came from the lack of affection from his own father. Now it is perfectly possible Kentler was always gay, 
but the resentment he had for his father pushed his views of sexual expression to the extreme. He believed that the sexual repression in German men throughout the war is what created the fascism and bloodlust. That sexual liberation would prevent another Auschwitz from happening. This psychology continued through the 1960s in Germany, where daycare centers began encouraging children to be naked and explore each other's bodies. This came also with the rise of the German Green Party, which was full of anti-war protesters and environmental activists. They tried to address the oppression of children's sexuality. Members actually advocated for the abolishing of the age of consent for sex between children and adults. Kentler goes on to pioneer this new sexual liberation period in Germany. He focuses on runaway youth, heroin addicts, and young prostitutes. He befriends a 13-year-old boy named Ulrich. Ulrich was one of the most sought-after male prostitutes in the subway station scene. So this is a 13-year-old boy who's given up his body for essential living. Kentler asked Ulrich what he would do when he needed a place to sleep. Ulrich spoke of a man named Mother Winter who fed the young boys and did their laundry. In exchange, they would sleep with Mother Winter. Ulrich was a handsome boy and he enjoyed sex, as Kentler described, so he could give back to the pedophile men who looked after him. This gave Kentler all the proof he needed to back his sick experiment. Instead of young men living with their oppressive, macho, Nazi propagandist fathers who didn't allow them to express their sexuality and never showed any affection, he would relocate these young boys into the care of a pedophile man who was not as strict and would take care of the kids. In exchange, these men would do what they would please with the boys. Kentler argued to the government that the boys being relocated were severely neglected and were looked at as a lost cause, but putting them in the homes of the pedophiles, they would be nurtured in a better way because he believed that because they are pedophiles that they loved these boys in all aspects, even sexually, meaning they would receive the affection that they didn't previously. This is an obvious projection of Kentler's unresolved feelings with his father. As Marco grew up living with the horrible reality and just accepting his life with this man, he began to resent Honkel. When he hit puberty, he would often spend hours at a time every day working out so that he could be strong enough to defend himself. One night, when Honkel tried to fondle Marco, Marco knocked his hand away very aggressively. At this point, Honkel gave up and he actually left the room. This drove him to become further psychologically manipulative. He would end up locking the door to the kitchen so Marco couldn't eat, and he would often take out his frustration on Marco and beat on him, and Marco would just stand there and take the hits. When Marco turned 18, he was finally eligible to move out of Honkel's house, although after all the trauma, he did not know how to move on. Helmut Kentler went on to stop associating himself with Honkel in 1999, changing his perspective on pedophilia. He states that children and adults could never share in sexual liberties because the adult would always be in a monopoly. After Marco moved out of Honkel's home, Honkel tried to contact him on two separate occasions. Once in his 20s when Honkel called and seemed to have dementia because he asked Marco if he had fed the rabbits that they had that had already died. And the second time was in 2015 where Marco's wife was pregnant with their first child. Marco overheard that Honkel was in hospice in the same hospital dying of cancer. Marco stepped into the room and as he saw Honkel laying on the bed groaning in pain, he had a long beard and looked at Marco as if he didn't know him and had forgotten him. Marco looked in his eyes for less than five seconds to confirm that this man was dying. Then he turned around, slowly shut the door and walked out of the hospital. Honkel died the next day. After this, Marco began to forgive, and freedom came slowly but surely. That chapter had finally ended, and he had faced it, and now he could finally move on.